does it feel? Power. I need more power. Bang on tear? Put it in reverse, tear! Put it in reverse! Oh lord! Lord save! Oh lord! Oh save! How to pick the correct wattage power supply? This is a tricky question, especially for first time builders who might not be familiar with how power hungry some of their system components are. But I will also say this, once you do select that first power supply, subsequent PC builds become much simpler. That comes with the territory. You get an idea for how power hungry systems are. Uh, and you can choose a power supply wattage higher than that according to a specific buffer zone, which we'll also discuss in this video. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's talk about power consumption and how to select the perfect power supply. Let's start first with a common misconception. This is something I wanna get out of the way first and foremost because I see it quite a bit. I see people recommending power supplies based solely on TDPs. Now this is a good way of kind of gauging roughly what your components will be desiring in terms of power, but it's not just a, a surefire thing. Like if a CPU has a TDP of 91 watts, that does not mean that that CPU will only consume 91 watts. In fact, if you want to overclock a CPU, you might consume upwards of 150 watts of power under full load. Uh, and even with stock frequencies in mind, sometimes those power spikes do jump well beyond 91 watts. TDP stands for thermal design power, and as such, it describes the cooler capacity needed to keep that CPU or GPU or whatever you're talking about uh, well within its thermal limits. So you can see how TDP and total power consumption are somewhat proportional as you increase total power draw. The heat output must also increase, but there's a small margin there for the work to be done. Most of it is lost in the form of heat because no system is 100% efficient. So in summary, adding TDPs is actually an underestimation of total power draw. It would make no sense for a component to lose more energy in the form of heat than it is drawing energy from the wall. That, that just doesn't add up. So we're gonna run through some general rules of thumb and then we will talk specifics. First and foremost, it is important to note that the two most power hungry components in your system will almost always be your graphics card and your CPU, usually in that order. So when it comes to picking a PSU, you'll want to refer to these two first and foremost. It makes sense to base your power supply wattage on load consumption, of course, but there are several scenarios to consider. Gaming load, editing workload, torture load, the list goes on. Depending on what you do, your power consumption will vary. If you play quite a few video games on a daily basis, you're probably pulling more power from the wall than if you were editing on a daily basis. Usually editing software, you know, if you wanna do video editing, photo editing, that'll usually leverage your CPU more than anything else. But gaming workloads will leverage CPU and GPU horsepower in different ways. And usually they're both being used around 50, 60% if the game is well optimized and you have a balanced system. Now a torture loop is a bit more extreme than a gaming loop because you're using unrealistic benchmarks in most cases to determine how stable your components actually are. So they'll put unrealistic workloads on your CPU and GPU to ensure that under the worst case scenario, those components will be stable at given frequencies and voltages. Prime 95 is an excellent example of a CPU torture test. It just adds an unrealistic workload to the unit itself. It's a good indication of how stable your system is with said overclock. Think of it as a worst case scenario when GPU and CPU usages are maxed out at 100%, which rarely happens, at least both at the same time. So a gaming workload is a pretty safe underestimation of what your power supply wattage should be, but I also recommend choosing a wattage higher than the torture load. Power supplies can often supply wattage above rated limits, i.e. 750 watts pulled from a 700 watt power supply. It is possible, but it isn't recommended for long-term use as transformers and rails can become extremely hot. So there is a surefire way of determining how much power your build will pull from the wall under any given workload. Use a watt meter, stick it between the outlet and the power supply and boom, that's how much power your system is pulling under any given load. But keep in mind that some of that power will be lost due to the inefficiencies of the power supply itself. So somewhere between 80 and 90% of that in most cases is actually being used by the computer. But the problem with that, of course, is that you need the computer built beforehand. So how would you know what power supply to use in the build if you have to have the PC built before you can determine how much power it's pulling from the wall? That contradiction is why I recommend a site like Tom's Hardware. I trust their reviews 100% and all of their power supply investigations, all of their different uh, component power consumption graphs are super helpful for first time builders. I've linked their site in this video's description. Take this one for example. This graph depicts CPU torture test power consumptions. We've got the Ryzen 7 CPUs here, the Intel Core i7 7700K and a few other hungry counterparts. I recommend starting here or at a graph similar to this one 
for your CPU of choice. Just Google something along the lines of Tom's Hardware Ryzen 5 1600X power consumption, just insert your CPU or GPU of choice. And that's the beauty of their testing. They've tested and compared almost every mainstream component on the market. So if, for example, your CPU-GPU combo is a Ryzen 5 1600 GTX 1070, search for both of these graphs similar to this one and add them up. In the case of this example, roughly 90 watts plus 170 watts for a sum of 260. This is a very low figure, however, and it would be unwise to shove a 260 watt power supply into this system. Several factors should be accounted for, including overclockability, whether or not the graphics card is referenced or AIB, and how many other components or peripherals are in the system. Addressing overclockability first, this is a slippery slope. Generally speaking, overclocks tend to drastically increase power consumption. So a 5% initial frequency overclock might increase power consumption by 5%, followed by 10% for the next 5% overclock, followed by 20% for the next 5% overclock, and so on. So you see how it's, they're not directly related, and they're not linear by any means. So the i9-7900X, that was a notorious power hog, but lower core count chips will usually manage power in a much more civil manner, and that's what most consumers will go after, something like a two, four, or six core CPU. So it really depends on what you're sporting in your rig and what your overclock or intended overclock is. But as a general rule of thumb, I recommend at least a 50% load power consumption buffer for your CPU, unless your reference is already showing overclocked consumption. So for our example, multiply 90 watts by 1.5 for a 135 watt overclock torture workload. Following suit then, our 1600X 1700 combo now has a power buffer of 135 watts plus 265 for a 400 watt total power consumption. This is a pretty bare bones recommendation, but I'd be willing to bet my lunch money that a proper 400 watt PSU could handle this combo in a full system. Is it recommended though? No, absolutely not. Unless your power supply is 100% efficient, which is impossible, higher power demand will result in more of it lost in the form of heat, which explains why power supplies get hotter and louder under load. So it's a safe practice to include an additional buffer. I swear by 50%, but you're free to throw in something higher. I recommend higher, don't go much lower than that. For a 400 watt calculation like ours, a 50% additional buffer zone yields 600 watts, which should also account for hard and solid state drives, LEDs, peripherals, and fans. Most of these smaller components usually won't consume but a few watts each. So if you put together a system like this one here, which I would consider well balanced, it's linked in the video description by the way, a 600 watt power supply with a solid efficiency rating from a reputable brand would put you in a great position. Your supply should stay rather quiet if it's built well, and sharp power spikes shouldn't trip your system. Feel free to apply this rule across the spectrum, by the way. Introducing a second CPU, which would be weird for a gaming system, or a second graphics card, which I imagine most consumers would be more interested in, uh, would only require that you repeat the aforementioned process just one more time for said component. I will say, though, that if you're going to SLI or Crossfire two graphics cards, you don't just multiply the original load power consumption for the single card by two. That's not how those configurations work. Actually, SLI and Crossfire are pretty inefficient when you wanna look at it from a power consumption standpoint. So if one card's consuming 200 watts under full load uh, and you stick a second card, the exact same one in there, you're not gonna have a 400 watt load. In fact, you might have something along the lines of a 300 or 350 watt load, uh, and that's under like a best case scenario. So really, if you add a second graphics card, you don't even really have to add that 50% buffer. It could be something lower. Just keep in mind, like, don't be surprised if your system is not really pulling that much more from the wall if you add that second card. For most builds with a single graphics card and CPU, it'll be perfectly fine on a six to 800 watt power supply. I would say upper towards 800 watt would be well within your safe zone. You could even upgrade, add a second graphics card and still be okay. Generally, the more expensive the components inside though, the higher the wattage should be, again, just for peace of mind. Wouldn't make much sense to pair a $40 PSU with a $1,500 system. While in many cases, your system would run perfectly fine, as I've proven in this video right here, it's just not good practice to pair an ultra cheap power supply with an ultra expensive computer. Even if your computer isn't that expensive, you would really hate yourself if your power supply took your entire system with it because you decided to cheap out on one component that you should not have. A simple analogy, don't pair a 600 horsepower Ferrari with a set of $20 tires that you picked up at a junkyard. Makes no sense. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, thumbs down for the opposite. Be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for more content in my original studio in Florida. I'm still in Germany, but I'll be home very soon. A long plane ride ahead. Not looking forward to that one. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.